Early success is a, is a very strange animal. It makes the, the, the climb of the rest of your life that step by step by step, thinking out your steps, making your plan, that it makes that impossible because you, you know that you can fly. From my experience, I really did think it was a short ride into a brick wall. Like so many of the artists of my generation, it was a short ride, it's like a rocket chair into, into a brick wall. I had no clue that I would live this long or even survive my 20s. And a lot of people in my world probably didn't think I was gonna last very long because the way I drank and the way I partied and the way I painted and the way I lived and the way I did my clumsy way that I existed. It's a surprise to me. I think that there are probably a lot of people who are mighty disappointed that I've managed to keep going. New York in the 80s. I guess I first showed up in New York in the 80s when I was 17. I just graduated high school, had an exhibition in Los Angeles and kind of took whatever money I could get from that and dragged myself to New York. It was an ad in the newspaper. It was a guy named Don from Marina Del Rey who was uh, driving shady brown bag vehicles to sell in New Jersey. And we had them uh, chained corporate cars chained together and you had no steering and you could barely stop them. And I signed up to this gig where you get a hundred bucks when you get to New York. And I uh, drove to New York in this incredibly strange caravan with like a, a couple of Israeli soldiers and a psychic and a doo-wop singer. And there were, it was a hairy, hairy, it was the hairiest trip ever. I think we flipped, we jackknifed two of the cars in Oklahoma. And it was, you know, it was, and we just had to keep going. It was one of these crazy runs. And when I got to New York, I kind of bummed around, signed up at the Arts Students League, just scrounged and scraped for money looking at, working at uh, various construction jobs. And I was there to be a great artist. I wanted to paint. I had been painting for a long time up until then. And I, I you know, but I still was making it up as I went along and, and picking up whatever skills and materials I could find. And working a lot, at the, having a studio at the Art Students League, you know, you could get a locker and a, some hours, you can go in and work. And I started producing my first body of work in New York out of there. Apart from the museums, you know, where there was a, a, a lot of antiquities and, and, and things at the, the Met and all the museums and galleries and, and you know the trendy galleries and Cindy Sherman and and you know George Gross and you know Julian Schnabel and Andy Warhol and all of that. There was the, the street art. And the street art was the first real glimpse of the universe of archetypes sort of merging up and spilling off of the walls. Everywhere you went, there was like a new symbol popping up and a new profile, an image. And um, it really felt like the walls were speaking to you. Everywhere you went, the walls were speaking to you. And this was, uh, uh, this was really empowering. I was excited about my work from, from the beginning. I was excited by the, the prospect of creating something uh, magically, like pfft, there it is, you know. Uh, I, 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 really str I was really struggling to arrive at a style that was immediate, you know, and I was really sort of conceited about the materials I used. I only, you know, bought the most expensive oil paints. I'd be throwing like a thousand dollars worth of paint on a painting, you know, and a, you know, you invest that much material in your material and you have to move it, you know, just so that you can get more. And um, I found myself uh, living with and like the whole underbelly of New York, which were mostly alcoholics and junkies and fashion models and this kind of hungry people. And I was hungry for paint because the growth was so radical 
in terms of like what I could produce. I was surprising myself all the time. And I mean, of course, I was probably my own biggest audience, my most informed audience was like, well, is that bitchin'? Did I make something that impressed me? Did it blow me away? You know, was it powerful? I was desperate to, to you know, make something that, that had power, that sort of sh shot out at you and talked to you and was, was you know, a part of your, your environment in an invasive way. I guess I wasn't... You know, I wasn't in the decoration game. I wasn't making things for tasteful apartments or, you know, satisfying, calm, corporate art. I've been a, a, a real believer in... Though, of course, there's Van Gogh, right? Van Gogh is this, is this person who could shock you with a little, little rectangle. And the, the, the Impressionists, you know, creating a sense memory of uh, an expanded emotional state, an expanded experience. They were, they were actually boxing a sense memory for you. And you were like, and if, you know, if you recognize it, the, the impression is painted for your unconscious. They were painting a light, yeah, but it's not the light that's bouncing off of the object. It's the light that's coming out of the object and out of the subject. New York just eats you up. I mean, especially if you're from California. Eventually, I'd spent, uh, you know, enough of my psychic energy and my myself living in the nightclubs and the and the parties and the galleries that I'd actually somehow managed to gain a lot of attention. You know, people were starting to pay to, to notice my work, and I was and and notice me and and. Um, I eventually got introduced to these uh, advertising agencies who were looking to use the, the cachet of the New York underground, you know, Lower East Side artist scene, Tama Janowitz, Pete, John Lurie, um, Mapplethorpe. Uh, and I got, I got pulled into that mix as the, you know, the young crazy painter you know and i i got used in a uh, in an ad campaign for roses lime juice this was the first time i think they had been doing that i was the first one they were of underground arts figures culture figures to sell a product i think i was still too young to actually drink legally and here i was selling mixer it was a strange experience because Suddenly, my profile just jumped out of nowhere, and I was on, you know, 200-foot-high billboards in Times Square, and you get out of the, come out of the subway in Queens, and there I was, and I didn't have subway fare, but I was plastered on every billboard across the city. And magazines wanted to dress me up, put me in their clothes. It was a, a really very strange experience. I ended up having a show on West Broadway. It was a wild time for you know, a 19-year-old. And in that scene, in that, that underground scene, mostly centered around a nightclub called Area, I got to meet and, and hang out with a lot of the big names, the, the artists at the time, you know, Julian Schnabel, Andy Warhol, Jean-Michel Basquiat, Longo, David Warren Waritz, and sort of interface with all of, all of them, Corso, Gregory Corso. Andy was, um, was this sort of like grandmotherly character with everybody. He really didn't say much. He was incredibly passive everywhere he went, you know, because everything just came to him. He was the center of everything. So he didn't have to do anything except like point and, oh, that's wonderful. And, oh, that's really great. It was strange. On a number of occasions, I would be brought before him for like a, an anointing. Oh yes, you're really glamorous. We think you're great, you know. And and um, and I got to hang out a lot with Jean Michel. And Jean Michel, you know, was very, very sort of socially competitive. And he was incredibly, incredibly astute. Uh, he was, you know, raised in a, in a you know in a, in a, in a very mannerly 
uh, sophisticated background. His father was a diplomat, you know, and, and he, he really know how, knew how to network with people and speak to them in a way that made them feel good. And you know, I, on the other hand, was a, just a, a, a gorilla. I was out of control. I had come out to Panga Canyon and didn't know how to behave socially or behave in any kind of political way. All I knew that I was, was committed to my work and I had to do that at the expense of everything else. And I think people took my sort of simplicity, my crudeness, as a kind of arrogance. And of course they were fascinated by that. So sometimes ignorance is bliss. I showed a lot of work um, in St. Mark's Square, you know, over what once was a hair salon and then became the boy bar and then was Gracie Mansion Gallery. And I, you know, worked a lot in that area. I hung all sorts of shows, uh, underground shows, Nature Mort, down in Alphabet City. And I guess my big show was Charlie Coles on Broadway. And Charlie sort of took me on almost, I guess, a, on a bet. When I was preparing for that show, I had an eight-month lead-up. And I was just producing, 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 producing these deep impostos, deep, deep. I was throwing thousands and thousands of dollars worth of paint at these canvases, looking for that sense memory, looking for that, that hallucination. And I really felt like I delivered on that work. And it was, I think, a week before the exhibition, I had a head-on collision in a taxi cab on Lexington and ended up in the hospital. It was an insane time on life support. And of course, Charlie Coles was horrified, but, but also there was this excitement that happens around artists when they're self-destructing, especially when it's like these horrible events. I wish I understood it. I mean, it's kind of a universal, but in the 80s, it was especially true. There's a special relationship that an artist has with his mortality. It anticipates a cutoff on the, the work. We fight to live, but our value is heightened by our self-destruction. I mean, John Michel is a perfect example of that. So the accident, I don't know if it hurt me or helped me in, in the art world. Yeah, it was a great show. Like, honestly, what's success? Success is a lot of money. Success is a lot of money. That's how we measure success in this culture. If you have a lot of money, you're successful. But success as an artist, you don't know. You live in a kind of a dream and you hope you're doing the right thing and you hope that you believe. If you can believe in your stuff, if you can believe, that's success. If you can believe. When you lose your belief, then, then it's failures. So for an artist, success is not a final object or a final condition, but it's actually a state. It's like a phase state transition. And you're in and out of this state of belief in your experience and your, your ability to draw down from the invisible and, and make it visible. And it's, so it's a, it's a state. It's a, it's a state that you, you constantly re, uh, reinvent for yourself every day, every time you get in front of a canvas. Higher senses, other worlds, hidden dimensions, flying squirrels. What are the qualities of the expanded state? And who says enlightenment is so freaking great? Fake enlightenment, now fake enlightenment, now. All time radiant beings have come to show.
show us how it's done Sometimes we kill them, but that's okay Another one is born a hundred times Throughout all time, rained in beans and come They can show us how it's done Fake Sometimes we kill them, that's okay Fake Do 